What is almost certainly the oldest hatred in the history of mankind is anti-Semitism. It's usually defined as discrimination or hatred of the Jewish people because of or in connection to their heritage, the Torah. Through history, anti-Semitism has taken various forms, reached varying levels of ugliness, but without doubt, it sank to its lowest depths during the years of the Second World War under the regime of Nazi Germany. There was a time when millions of Jews were killed for no crime other than the fact that they were Jews. The Nazi onslaught was against the very underpinnings of Jewish heritage. There was a focus to undermine Torah, Yiddishkeit, shuls, famous rabbonim, books, sforim, sifrei kodesh. But what's most important, of course, is the fact that, like all of their predecessors who attempted to reduce the Jewish people to a memory or a page in a history book, the Nazis also failed. Rabbi Yossi Wallace is one of the world's most prominent figures in the Baal Tshuva movement and in Jewish outreach. My father came from Poland, my mother from Hungary. They both went through Auschwitz, Dachau, various death marches, camps, and so on. And many things that I've done in my life, the many thoughts that I've had in my life, are results of stories I've heard about the Holocaust to a point that I feel that I myself went through the Holocaust. There's an idea that within each Jew, there's an essence of Jewish identity, a Jewish spark that can never be extinguished. That spark, no matter how small, can always be fanned into a raging fire of belief and observance. The core concept of the Jewish faith was expressed by a most unlikely person, actually, Adolf Hitler Yamach Shemo himself. If only one country, for whatever reason, tolerates a Jewish family in it, that family will become the germ center for fresh sedition. If one little Jewish boy survives, without any Jewish education, with no synagogue, no Hebrew school, Judaism is in his soul. Even if there had never been a synagogue or a Jewish school or an Old Testament, the Jewish spirit would still exist and exert its influence. It has been there from the beginning, and there is no Jew, not a single one, who does not personify it. Ironically, how right he was. Every Jewish child has that spirit within him, and through that spirit, Judaism, Yiddishkeit, has emerged stronger than ever before. It becomes clear from reading the writings of Hitler that one of the things that sparked a raging fire of anti-Semitism inside him was the outward appearance of the Hasidic Jew, what he referred to as the Ostjuden, that is Jews of the East, it triggered in him a revulsion that contributed to his satanic hatred of the Jew. The visible image of the openly religious Jew who dared to appear in public in the German world became a key element of what ultimately became a full-blown war against the Jewish people. When you attack people for being a race, you just try to annihilate them, and you think once you do it, once you kill them, you are done with them. When you are going after a religion, it's a different story, and your tactics are different as well. In this document, he transmits an order from the Chief of Security Forces 
instructing German immigration officials not to grant, and I repeat, not to grant exit visas, specifically he says what he called the Ostjud. And Eckhart says the following, because these Orthodox Jews, Jews will emerge, he says, the Rabbiner, he says, and Talmud later. In other words, we save these Jews, it's not just these Jews that we're going to be saving. From these Jews is going to emerge a new generation of Jews that continue to follow the path of the existence of the Jewish people because these are the Rabbonim, these are the teachers, these are the Talmud lehrer, which are needed, he says, by American and world Jewry in order to be able for spiritual revival. Therefore, they must not be permitted to leave. The reason that the German fought against Judaism is because it was a spiritual war, not only physical. The Germans started everything by destroying synagogues, shuls, but they Knesset. So why did he fight against shuls, against synagogues? At the point, he knew what Judaism is all about. He knew that a Jew is symbolized by a synagogue, and this was the war, to uproot synagogues, to uproot spirituality. In Elul of 1944, Rabbi Yisrael Yitzchak Kohn was taken from the Lodz ghetto with the other remaining Jews. Initially, he was taken to Auschwitz and later to other concentration camps within Germany. When they come into Lodz, the first thing which they did was dynamiting the, the big shul and all the shul which were in Lodz. They made us go out from the factory all together in the street and look, have a look at it. And you couldn't turn away your face, you have to look at it. And the Germans were standing there and, and, uh, and watching us. So, so this was the fight against Yiddishkeit, against God. Hitler and Nazism stood for everything which was immoral, unethical, false and corrupt. The Jewish people introduced to the world the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments were accepted by the nations as the basis of morality, ethics and honesty. In this way, the Jews became the conscience of the world. And Hitler obviously could not tolerate the fact that here you have a group of people who are presenting just the opposite, the total opposite to himself and his views. Rabbi Wallace's father, a devout Polish Jew who had nearly succumbed to physical and spiritual persecution in Dachau, but a miraculous series of events galvanized his loyalty to Tyra and the loyalty of his son Yossi, and all because of a pair of tefillin. My father tells me the following, Dachau was also a death camp. They worked you to death. At the minute you were useless, they took you to the chambers or they shot you. They marched out a bunch of Jews to be shot because they were useless already. They had no strength to work. And my father was standing by watching as they marched them out to their death. There was a man there, an old man. He was holding a bag in his hand. And he threw the bag at me and I grabbed the bag, caught it. And the man yells at me, he says, this is yours. I thought maybe there's food there, a piece of bread maybe. My mind was all on bread, that's all I thought about it. And I open up the bag and what I see there, a pair of tefillin. What do you do with it? You can't throw it away. On the other hand, if they catch you with tefillin, they shot you on the spot. He says to me, I hid the tefillin, I put it under my shirt. I weighed about 30, 40 kilos, striped clothes. At night, I put the tefillin under my bunk at bed. Early in the morning, before they took out, they would count us every morning. I put this tefillin on me. And at that instant, the German walks into the barracks and he sees me. Immediately he calls the guards and they grab me. They took my number, I had a number on my arm. At the appeal, they count. The German SS officer in charge calls out my number. He said, step out. There was a small table there. He told me, get on a table. Above the table, there was a hanging rope from a bar. They put the rope around my neck. And then they're supposed to kick the table from under my feet. I'm supposed to fall down and hang. And the German officer in charge is waving that feeling to everybody and he shows it to them. He said, you see this? 
This dog is going to be hanged because he used it. Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf that there are only two powers in the world, Jews and German, because he understood something which other people don't understand even today, that the real power behind any power is the spiritual power. And Jews contains the positive spiritual power. Nazis were very calculating in their persecution of the Jews, and this was in order to crush the Jewish spirit. They'd learn what was most important to the Jew and Jewish life, and they would specifically pick tortures at significant times in the Jewish calendar in order to crush Jewish observance. They knew all the Dinim, the Minhogim, the Yiddish Yidden. It came out a Yontif, then uh, then they had the, they had a, really a spectacle. On Purim 1942, 10 Jews were hung in Zdonskavola. The local Nazi regime claimed this is to avenge the hanging of Amman's 10 children. Nazis fought against Judaism as part of their fight against the Jews. Nothing dehumanized the Jews in the concentration camps as much as getting them to inflict pain and suffering upon one another. The Germans did this by appointing Jews to be the officers over other Jews, kapos they were called, in each barracks. In fear for their own safety, the kapos were often cruel to their fellow Jews, although many risked their lives and showed great mesiris nefesh to help others. I have a capo which recognized me, and uh, he had a good job from the airport. And I got a job there a day before Yom Kippur, every Yom Kippur. It was a dream job in the camp. And the capo said that all the people which were now today, they shall come tomorrow. So the next day, we had a dilemma, because it was Yom Kippur. And so I talked to, to uh, we have a few Gere Bachurim, uh, and which, uh, which they uh, talked among us what we should we do. Should we go to work and have it better, or if we should have Yom Kippur try to sneak out? So we decided to sneak out. Sneaking out from a work that was like going over a, a burning pit with fire. So finally we did it, and we assembled in a block from the camp, and uh, we tried to make a minion, tried to remember static. But 10 minutes later, the door was opened with an SS coming in and shooting in in the air. And he said, out, everyone called out. And so they took us outside the camp and told us to dig uh, ditches because the, the Germans, before they shoot somebody, they, they didn't want to have work to bury them. So they told the uh, victims to dig their own grave. And so I remember still staying in the ditch already in the cave. When the SS moved away a little bit, so we started to dive a little bit to whatever we remember. We say in San Atoike, Mi Yechia, Mi Yomos. We knew already that this is the last time. But then the Rundstein had another idea. He wanted us to live. The building company, they didn't want to lose 15 young people which could use the work. They didn't have enough hands. So they sent out somebody by the SS. Another SS came with a motorcycle and they told them something we didn't hear. But then the SS told us to pull back up the ditches. And they took us in camp, so we knew that, that we were saved. As the Germans ravaged through Europe town by town, Always the first matter of business was persecution of the Jews. Shuls and Batemid Roshos were closed down or burnt along with their contents 
Over 1,200 shuls were destroyed in Poland alone. Believing that the way to break the Jews' spirit was to capture their leaders, the Nazis placed the great Polish Rabbonim at the top of their wanted list. When the Alexander Rebbe's picture, along with those of the Trebinarov and the Rebbe's of Ger and Belz, appeared in the venomous tabloid Der Sturmer, the Alexander Rebbe realized that he was the target for elimination. Incited by articles in the Nazi propaganda press, young German patriots joined the hunt for the arch enemy of the Reich, their Wunderrabbiner von Alexandro, Rav Yitzchok Menachem Danziger, Zeichet Tzadik Levrocha, author of the Akedas Yitzchok. Ultimately, the Rebbe of Alexander was apprehended, disguised as a common laborer working at the Handel Shoe Factory in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was taken with others to Treblinka where he was murdered. Although they were engaged in battle against the armies of dozens of nations, the Nazis somehow felt it crucial to capture one Hasidish Rebbe. They ran after famous names. They ran after the Imre Emes, the Ger Rebbe. They ran after the Belzerov. They ran after everyone that they thought that he is a great spiritual leader and they have seen as the essence of the Jewish people. When you kill the leaders, it's much easier to deal with the masses. Open any Nazi newspaper and you will see that Rabbanim became part of the caricatures of the Nazi media. In virtually every city and town they occupied, the Nazis set up a council of Jewish community leaders, a Judenrat, which was empowered to help implement the occupiers' cruel decrees against the Jews. In Lodz, the Nazis appointed as the Judenrat's leader one Chaim Mordechai Rumkowski, a businessman and a leader of the secular Jewish community prior to the war. He was himself transported to Auschwitz later and killed there in August of 1944. The Germans told Rumkowski to make a meeting of all the Rabunim. They made a, some kind of excuse that they need the Rabunim for an important meeting. And then Rumkowski sent his people to bring in all the Rabunim and they started to sit at the table. And when they came, they were all there. So the Germans came in with the SS with a truck and took them all away took them out of the ghetto and they shot them and they killed them. Moralities, ethics, as they are considered by us, were considered weakness by them, and they had to fight against it. Standing on a rickety table with a noose around his neck, Rabbi Wallace's father was moments away from death. Then he says to me, hey dog, What's your last wish before we hang you? As though he cared. Just for, for a joke. So I said to him, I want to put those on again. And he said, the German, wonderful, wonderbar, great idea. You put them on, and we'll hang you with those tefillin on your body, and we'll keep you hanging here for a day until tomorrow morning, and everybody will realize why we hung you. Educational, isn't it very educational? Put them on. He takes the tefillin and he puts them on. Rope still around his neck, standing up high, watching all the Jews, and they're watching him. There was a fence there. From the other side of the fence, there the women from the woman camp. They also came amongst those ladies in the women's section. Was a young woman, 17 years old, teenager, my mother. That's how she first met my father. Not a German stands there, and he's about to kick the table. And just before he kicks the table, and I'm supposed to fall down and hang, I yell out to the Jews. I looked at their eyes, I saw tears. I understood they were crying, because they pitied me. They felt sorry for me. 
So I yell out to the Jews, Jews, why are you crying? Don't you understand that I'm the winner here? And believe me, he said, I felt like a winner. You know what it means to stand in a Nazi death camp? And the last thing you do with feeling on your body and everybody's watching, including the Germans, I felt like a victor, not like a victim. So I said, why are you crying? I'm the winner. When the German heard that, he said, what? You are the winner? This death is too easy for you. I'll show you how to die. Get them off the table. They got them off. Get down to a squat position. He got down to a squat position. Bring him two heavy rocks under each arm. They brought two heavy rocks under each arm. He said, you're going to get 25 lashes with a whip on your head. And if you drop one of those rocks, which are under your arm, we'll shoot you right in the head and you'll die. We tried anything which we could, which we could to do to defy them. Like, uh, if we couldn't uh, dump Shemnesra, we dump it on the way. We dump Shemnesra walking. Then we went with the train to, the, to work, or from the work, and uh, the assessor was sitting across, and uh, we were sitting in a normal train, and would take us to work. Not, not the cattle train which we were transported. And so in the, in the SS told us, you Jews, you, didn't, you, you sing, you started singing your songs. But we didn't have our mind to sing, but we figured out something. So we sang, Vihishe Yomdo, Vihishe Yomdo, Vihishe Yomdo, Lava Seine Velona. They liked the song and we liked the words that, that, that the Jewish people can't be wiped up and we will survive. Every generation they want to wipe us out and the Kodesh Borchi saved us. The Jewish people has always been known as the Am for the people of the book. And this is because of their ongoing adherence to the Torah, to Limur HaTorah, the study of Torah, and to Jewish literature, Svarim. It's no surprise then that one of the focuses of anti-Semitism has always been Sifrei Kodesh, Jewish books. In many ways, the Germans acted like previous Jewish haters. In the Middle Ages, Jews were expelled from different countries. Pope Gregory IX, a prominent oppressor of the Jews, identified alleged heresies against Christianity in the Talmud, in the Gemara. He ordered that Jewish books be burned in Paris in June of 1242. 24 wagon loads of books, thousands of volumes were handed to the executioner for public burning. The start of a theological war against the Torah that would continue for centuries. A lot of testimonies show us that the German fought against Tashmish Kedusha, against Sifrei Toyo, against books in general. They burn books and they humiliate and desecrated books. When the Nazis came to my house, there was a big, what I called a pogrom on my father's Sforenschank. They came in and after my mother gave us some money, what she had, they started leaving the house and they noticed my father's serum shack or my father's uh, library. They saw the big gemaras. They probably never saw such big books. And they said, was is das? And I, I told them, in assembly, I told them, this is the Talmud. And when they heard the word Talmud, they went like Meshuggah. They, 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 they fell into such fury and they started uh, taking out the Gemaras and trampling off them and, and they started ripping apart and, and throwing out of the window. They hated the Talmud. They realized that the Talmud is something that was kept the Jewish alive for generations. Soon after the Germans invaded Poland in 1939, Lublin, which was the fourth largest Jewish community in Poland, fell into their hands. Less than one month later, they focused their hatred on the Jews' beloved yeshiva, Yeshiva's Chachme Lublin, built by Rabbi Meir Shapiro. On 
On October the 14th of 1939, German troops took over the majestic building, dismantling and destroying the massive library. Over 55,000 volumes, Svarin, were burnt in the town square. The Frankfurter newspaper, Frankfurter Zeitung, reported the Nazis' pleasure and delights in burning the library of the Lublin Yeshiva. For us, it was a matter of special pride to destroy the Talmudic Academy, which was known as the greatest in Poland. We threw the huge Talmudic library out of the building and carried the books into the marketplace where we set fire to them. The fire lasted 20 hours. The Lublin Jews assembled around and wept bitterly, almost silencing us with their cries. We summoned the military band and with joyful shouts the soldiers drowned out the sound of the Jewish cries. They started beating him. My father dropped the rocks. On the 25th count he dropped him, but he fainted. They thought he was dead. They threw him on a pile of dead people, which they had there. And the procedure was that they would take that pile and shove it into a ditch to burn it. But my father had great conscience, and he crawled out from that pile. And somebody passed by, threw a rag on his head, gave him some water and bread, and hit him under one of the barracks. And that's how my father survived. At the end of the war, when the Americans released him, that young lady walked over to my father. She knew she lost all her family. She had no place to go, she was scared. So she said, look, you're the only man I know. I'm afraid, I got no place to go. Would you marry me? And he said, yeah. They walked over to the Kloisenburg Rebbe who was there, one of the survivors. And he said, please bury us. And he took a piece of paper and wrote in the Ktuba handwritten, which I still have at home. And they got married. And I was born under that marriage. I want you to know, I lived a secular life. And I made sure. And you know when my father made sure? When I walked over to my father and said, Daddy, I need a pair of feeling. I got no feeling. And he started to cry. And he told me that story. And he said to me, Yossi, I'm joining you. You and I will make tshuva together. You and I will put tefillin together. You and I will keep Shabbat together from now on. That's the impact of that story. Quite a few years have already passed since the Holocaust. There are very few survivors left. Many, many of us are either children of survivors or grandchildren or great-grandchildren of survivors. If a Kodesh Baruch Hu allowed our parents or our grandparents to survive is because there is a mission to give over and transmit that rich and tremendous legacy of Kedusha and purity to Klali soil. The Nazi strike on heaven was certainly not the only time that the forces of evil attempted to destroy the Jewish people. It was perhaps the most desperate, the most systematic, perhaps the most horrific. But there is one other difference, and that is that it was based on the understanding of an individual that Yiddishkeit would live on as long as there was a single Jewish heart that continued to beat. But with all that the Nazis did to eradicate the Jews, the ghettos and camps and the trains, the millions that they murdered, they didn't even come close to their so-called final solution. The spirit of the Jewish people, their love for Torah, their commitment to Yiddishkeit was not broken. Instead, it was actually strengthened with resolve to rebuild and to renew. The great yeshivas, the centers of Jewish learning, Mir, Ponovich, Slabotka, Lakewood, which is really Kletsk, and of course the majestic Hasidic courts, Ger, and Bells, Vizhnitz, and Satmer. The beauty of the Eastern European shul, it's all been transplanted to other shores in fresh soil. The sacredness of Jewish life continues unabated.
exactly that which the Third Reich attempted to destroy and to uproot flourishes. We all await the redemption. Vivias Hagoyel, Vimeher, Vimeinu, speedily in our days. <laughs>